On an early sunny day, the main character, whose name is Jack, gives flowers to his girlfriend named Junia, whom he has been dating for a month. However, Junia is not impressed by Jack's gift and is about to say something to him with a cold face. Junia tells Jack that they are breaking up, without changing much in her face. An expensive convertible with a richly dressed guy at the wheel drives up to Junia. The guy wishes Junia a happy birthday, taking off his sunglasses, and apologizes for being late. Junia jumps into the arms of the newly arrived gentleman, saying that she was afraid that Jake would grab and tie her, to which he invites her to an expensive restaurant and promises to buy her gifts. Holding Junia close, the guy turns his gaze to Jake and says with an evil grin that relationships require a lot of money. Turning around and leaving, he adds that, apparently, Jake is hardly worthy of this. As the car with his now ex-girlfriend drives away from Jake, people behind his back begin to whisper, saying that he is the school's most famous suck-up, and that he worked like crazy from morning to night to earn money for a gift for his girlfriend. Jake falls to his knees, indignant that his sincerity could be rejected in an instant simply because he is not rich. Jake asks why he took so long to curry favor with his girlfriend if he received nothing in return. A mysterious voice sounds in the head of the main character, informing him that he is registered in a system in which he has two money accounts. Based on the data the voice told him, his personal budget is $138, and the budget for some counterattack is $1 trillion. The voice explains that Jake can only spend money from the counterattack account on some girl, and everything related to his personal payments is paid from his personal account. The voice adds that 1% of the money spent on the girls will be returned to his personal account, thereby encouraging him. Ready to spend a lot on all sorts of nonsense, the main character stands up, holding a card in his hand and says that the counterattack begins right now. Jake goes to the mall, thinking that first he needs to find some girl and try out this card. Jake finds Janiya's classmate named Audrey, and a voice in his head tells him that a high-class girl has been found and gives her information, saying that if Jake's crush level reaches 100%, he will need to find a new target. Jake approaches Audrey asking for a moment of her attention, and a voice in his head adds that Audrey's current level of infatuation with him is negative. Audrey suggests that Jake needs help with Junia again, and advises him to give up, because she has already found herself a rich guy. Jake says that Audrey is wrong and he just wanted to offer her some tea, thinking about trying the card on her first. Audrey is perplexed, saying that she doesn't understand this proposal, considering that they don't even know Jake. After this, Audrey adds that the cafe where she is sitting serves special tea, which costs a lot of money and doubts that he can afford it. The line behind Jake begins to show dissatisfaction with him hanging around in one place for so long and doing nothing. Jake approaches the seller, asking how many glasses it will take for the entire line, to which she tells him that it will take about 180 glasses. Jake declares that he is buying all 180 glasses at his own expense, declaring that Audrey will treat everyone, shocking the seller with her unprecedented generosity. Audrey warns Jake, saying that all this will cost several thousand yuan, and asks him not to act weird, but Jake takes out his gold card and asks him to pay it off. Having paid a considerable amount, Jake asks to serve tea to the guests as soon as possible and not to keep them waiting. The crowd thanks Jake, very surprised at such generosity, actively expressing admiration for the action of the protagonist. Jake approaches an astonished Audrey, asking her to help him with something. After some time, Jake and Audrey arrive at one of the richest shopping centers in the city. On the pedestal stands a very expensive luxury bag, attracting the eyes of buyers with its brilliant appearance. Standing next to her is Yunia and her new boyfriend, who says that he would like to buy her this bag, but his mother says that he spends money too carelessly, and today they have already bought enough. The guy invites her to eat first and then discuss everything else, to which Yunia agrees, but says to herself that without this bag the whole set of gifts seems incomplete. Suddenly Junia's attention is attracted by Audrey, calling Jake and walking with an expensive bag and a limited edition asking if he would mind if she bought it. Jake takes a closer look at Audrey's bag while Yunia asks in surprise what they're both doing here. Junia verbally attacks Jake, saying that he seems to be playing along with Audrey to make her jealous and asks if he didn't realize they broke up. Jake sullenly replies that he doesn't care about Junia and is just buying a bag for another person. Yunia wonders why such a poor man as Jake came to the premium store and does not believe a single word 
while a voice in his head tells him Unia's data, as it did recently with Audrey. Jake tells Unia that since they broke up, he doesn't have to explain anything and is free to go wherever he wants, adding that he's not the same anymore. Unia laughs at him, not understanding how in a few hours he managed to get out of poverty and become a millionaire, and her boyfriend says that if Jake was really rich, he would have bought this bag long ago. Jake grins evilly, saying that he really can't afford that and he'll have to turn it down. However, he immediately shocks those around him with a loud statement that buying one bag is not enough and calls the store consultant for help. In front of an astonished audience, Jake confidently asks to pack all the things in this store for him. In disbelief, everyone watches as Jake gets all the goods in the store packed. The sellers approach Jake, informing him that the total amount to be paid is 11,320,000 yuan and bring a machine for payment by card. Junaya's boyfriend laughs in disbelief, saying that if Jake buys all this, he will eat a portion of crap, while Janiya herself says that Jake is crazy. However, the main character's magical golden card successfully pays for the purchase without any problems. The sellers thank Jake, who turns to Unia and her boyfriend, saying that he didn't know he had such talent and would love to see it. A generosity of unprecedented proportions shocks Audrey, making her feel embarrassed and blush. Unia and her boyfriend are in incredible shock, as are the other store patrons in disbelief at what Jake just did. Audrey clings to Jake, telling him that he is the best, and he replies that he is not like the others, who pretend to have deep feelings, but in reality are not ready to spend a cent. Junius' boyfriend tells her that he knows much more than ordinary people and that only complete fools who want to ruin their fortune would brag like that. He adds that, like a real major, he needs to be restrained, attracting the attention of an old woman passing by. The old woman recognizes him, shouting his name, to which he turns around in surprise, not expecting to see her here. The old woman slaps the guy, accusing him of treason, saying that she bought him expensive clothes, a watch and a car, calling him a bastard. The guy kneels in front of the old woman, saying that he was wrong and all this is because of Junia, asking for forgiveness. The old lady says that she will not forgive him, but she can give him a chance if he gives Junia two slaps otherwise they will break up right now. Without thinking twice, the guy gives Yunia a strong slap in the face, leaving a red mark on her face. From the force of the blow, Yunia loses her balance and falls to the ground, looking in fear at her now ex-boyfriend. The young gigolo rips off her necklaces, saying that she is a selfish person who steals other people's boyfriends, and it was he who bought her all the jewelry. Rising to her feet, Yunia tries to hug Jake, pushing Audrey away in an attempt to tell him something. Jake, however, turns away and pushes Unia away from him, not wanting to listen to anything. Falling to the ground again, Unia sadly looks after Jake, unable to find words. Junia runs away, starting to cry, and a mysterious voice in Jake's head tells him that her crush on the main character has only increased, causing him bewilderment. Audrey says she didn't expect things to turn out so badly, and that she feels really bad for Janiya, noting, However, that Janiya is a big bitch and wondering if this will make Jake feel better. Jake says that Yunia is selfish and doesn't deserve sympathy, and suggests that she forget her friend and see if she wants anything else for herself. Audrey is secretly glad that Yunia is out of the game and says that she does not know how to respond to the kindness of the protagonist. Jake says they could get closer by increasing Audrey's infatuation, to which she flirtatiously calls him a jerk. Audrey says that in order not to be rude, she will also spend money on Jake, surprising him with this arrangement. Jake asks Audrey if she would really spend money on him, to which she, smiling cheerfully, pushes him into the clothing store, directing him to the fitting room. After choosing better clothes for Jake, she tells him that if he doesn't know how to dress properly, people will underestimate him. Having chosen all the clothes Jake needs, Audrey goes to the checkout and pays for everything he chose. Jake leaves the fitting room, transformed beyond recognition, attracting the attention of others with his new style. Audrey says to herself that she couldn't imagine how good Jake would look in normal clothes, saying that he is a real treasure, becoming more and more attracted to him. Jake looks in the mirror, amazed at how much more handsome he has become, and not understanding why Audrey spent money for him, albeit small, compared to his expenses. Evening comes and a happy Audrey returns to the girl's dormitory, humming romantic tunes. Entering the room, Audrey finds Yunia sitting on a chair, drying her hair with a hairdryer. 
Audrey sighs in fear as she notices the bruise on Junya's face, asking if she's okay. Yuni replies that everything is fine with her, saying that thanks to Jake she saw the real face of her ex-boyfriend, otherwise she would have lived only in dreams. Audrey replies that she hopes Janiya will be more selective about guys in the future, hiding behind her new purse, asking Janiya about it, to which she replies that Jake bought it for Audrey, so she should keep it. Audrey hugs Yunia, saying that she was afraid that she would mind, to which she replies that since they are friends, she cannot mind. However, Yunia thinks to herself how Audrey dared to get involved in her relationship with Jake, and Audrey does not understand who prevented Yunia from staying with him and not falling for the rogue major. Jake returns to the boy's dorm, wearily wondering if he should spend more time sucking up, or if he might need to change his method. On the way to his room, Jake meets his friends who are watching some girls stream and says hello to them. One of his friends, whose name is Dismas, says that Jake's clothes are worth a lot, while the rest of his friends suspect that he bought a fake to appear like a major. Dismas puts his arm around Jake's shoulder, saying that he heard about what happened today. In his opinion, Jake spent too much money courting Junia, who rejected him anyway and offered to donate to streamers who at least show more attention. Jake's friends say that no matter how much you spend on a streamer, she will still love everyone, and even an ordinary guy can afford it. Jake takes Dismuz's advice, saying that donating to streamers is the ideal plan. Jake smiles and places his hand on Dismuz's shoulder, thanking him for his valuable advice. As Jake leaves, his friends say they are surprised that Jake thanked them for their advice even though they were making fun of them. Walking into his room and relaxing on his bed, Jake logs into the Leopard's Tooth app. Jake decides to register under the nickname Beggar and decides to watch the broadcast for the first time. Jake remembers that the guys mentioned the name of the streamer Chai Chai and enters it into the search bar. Using a link to Chai Chai, Jake ends up on a stream of a skimpily dressed dancing girl around whom a large number of loving comments appear. Jake finds the streamer attractive and wonders if he can launch a counterattack against the person on the other side of the screen. A voice in your head says that your appearance must exceed 80 points, otherwise it will not be possible to launch a counterattack, but streamers often use filters, so determining their appearance will be problematic. Jake says it's a well-thought-out system, but in his opinion, Chai Chai's appearance even without filters is above 90, so it doesn't bother him. Meanwhile, a top donor under the nickname Reynold comes to Chai Chai's stream and gives the streamer five golden leopards, which in monetary terms is equal to 10,000 yuan, to which Chai Chai receives enthusiastic reactions and gratitude. In the chat, Reynold says that the competition between streamers Chai Chai and Pun Pun will begin soon, and asks if everyone is ready, to which Jake asks Chai Chai how to send her a gift and how much money needs to be transferred to become top one. Reynold becomes embittered by such impudence and asks Chai Chai to ban the new user. Chai Chai thinks that she can only win this competition thanks to Reynold, and the newcomer most likely will not send her a single gift, so she asks the moderator to kick Jake out. Jake is immediately banned, and he stares at the screen in surprise, not believing what is happening. However, without thinking twice, he decides that if he was banned from the Chai Chai stream, then he will go watch Pun Pun. The competition begins and Chai Chai tells Pun Pun that he is worried about her, because she does not have a single top donor, and invites her to immediately give up in exchange for a more lenient punishment. Pun Pun, dressed as a cat, says that she has a lot of good donors, so instead of chatting, it's better to start the competition as soon as possible. The competition begins, and the participants begin to perform various actions that their donors ask them to do. The competition continues, and streamer Pun Pun is very far behind in terms of the number of donations. Chai Chai's spectators irritably egg on Pun Pun, ordering her to keep dancing and not do nonsense. Suddenly Pun Pun receives the most expensive gift in the form of a golden dragon. Reynold gets up from his chair in shock, surprised that someone would fork out for such an expensive gift, the monetary equivalent of 15,000 yuan. Streamer Pun Pun thanks the user under the nickname Beggar, leaning forward and folding a heart. Shocked by what is happening, streamer Chai Chai realizes that most likely this beggar is the same user they just banned. Jake finally figured out how to connect the card to streaming services and found the most expensive gift. Jake continues to send out golden dragons, amazing viewers and streamers, quickly closing the gap between Pun Pun and Chai Chai. Streamer Pun Pun tries to warn Jake that the first round will end soon, and since sending dragons is expensive, 
he should wait until the next round. Reynold realizes that this is most likely the same newcomer whom they recently kicked out and gloats that Jake, in his opinion, does not understand the rules and spent all his savings in a lost round. However, Jake continues to bombard Pun Pun with golden dragons, sending them out in the hundreds. All viewers of the stream, including Jake's friends, cannot believe what happened, looking at the screens in shock. Chai Chai, realizing that victory is slipping out of her hands, changes her face and sadly looks at the counter. Jake buys more and more golden dragons, the counter of which already exceeds one and a half thousand, unattainably increasing the Pun Pun donation counter. Reynold, in horror, counts the number of dragons sent, remembering that during the year of his viewing, Chai Chai sent her a total of only 3 million yuan. Chai Chai tallies up the total number of gifts, realizing that Pun Pun's account has just been replenished with 24 million yuan. Pun Pun puts on cat gloves and jumps on the spot, thanking Jake for the golden dragons. After this, Pun Pun turns to Chai Chai, telling her not to sit idly by and move on to her punishment. Chai Chai begins to fulfill Pun Pun's request to the hooting of her subscribers. Carrying out the next task of Pun Pun, Chai Chai admits to herself that she is very angry with Reynald, because if not for him, then these 1,600 golden dragons would have been hers. To everyone's adoration, Jake writes that Chai Chai either bans Reynald or leaves himself, after which Reynald leaves the chat. Pun Pun accepts congratulations and rejoices at the victory, once again thanking Jake for his help. Jake receives a lot of messages on his account, among which he notices an apology from the streamer Chai Chai. Chai Chai writes to the main character that she saw that he lives in the city where she is going the day after tomorrow for a photo shoot and asks if they can meet somewhere. Jake decides that the fish was caught in his net and this will be excellent compensation for his work and answers Chai Chai that a meeting is possible. Chai Chai is happy that the meeting has been scheduled and kisses the phone with happiness, answering that she is really looking forward to the meeting. The next day, Jake wakes up in a great mood noting to himself that he has never slept so well. Jake's friends dress up to go outside, inviting Jake to go have breakfast with them. Jake turns them down, telling them to go without him because his girlfriend will bring him breakfast. Friends are worried about Jake, thinking that something is wrong with him, because he was chasing his only girl for three years, and yesterday he was so calm after breaking up. Students are standing at the entrance to the women's dormitory, discussing that everyone has come to give breakfast to Unia and Audrey. Dismas approaches a group of students, saying that they are no different from heels, and being like Jake is not an option. To a pointed question about what he himself brought in the box, he replies that it is milky sweet French macaroni, costing 600 yuan apiece, adding that courting a girl requires real money. Waking up, Audrey and Yunia go down the stairs, talking about something. Students meet girls, showering them with gifts, trying to please them with their advances. Audrey coldly accepts sweet pasta from class leader Dismas, dryly thanking him for the gift. Turning around, Dismas notices Jake and his friends and roommates walking nearby. Dismas calls out to Jake from the crowd, drawing his attention to him. He asks him if Jake brought breakfast for Junia, even though he probably won't need it since she left him. According to Dismas, since Junia already ordered delivery today, Jake has no chance of getting anything, and he should come early tomorrow. Audrey approaches Jake asking if he had breakfast, to which Jake says that since she offered him breakfast together, he skipped breakfast. Jake's friends can't believe that Jake's new girlfriend is Audrey and express their surprise out loud. Dismas and his friends are very surprised by what they hear and fall into a stupor. A courier arrives to Unia and gives her a package of food, saying that her delivery has arrived. Audrey says she brought him some milky pasta, and a voice in Jake's head says his crush rate has gone up 7%. Jake enjoys the pasta, surprised that Audrey made him breakfast and her affection continues to grow. Junia approaches Audrey and Jake, saying that she bought him a natural breakfast for 368 yuan. Junia tries to gain Jake's favor by saying that all these three years he has done a lot for her, and she is very touched, and now she will always take care of him. Jake is unimpressed by Junia's show of concern and realizes that once he starts cozying up to her again, she'll start shunning him. Jake turns away from Junia, saying that there is no need to cuddle with him since there are so many of her other fans nearby. A voice in Jake's head tells him that both girls' infatuation has increased, while each girl thinks that Jake's action is motivated by love for her. Jake is perplexed by this outcome of events, 
and tries to understand why the degree of their infatuation is constantly growing. The students sincerely do not understand why Unia and Audrey are fighting over Jake, despite the fact that they are best friends. Unia and Audrey surround Jake, each of whom persuades him to eat her breakfast. Junia sits Jake down on the bench and feeds him breakfast while Audrey looks on with indignation. Dismas doesn't believe that Audrey and Janaya can fight for a man, much less a man like Jake, and he wonders how he was able to achieve this. Jake gives Dismas the middle finger, saying that yesterday that finger pressed the screen more than 1,600 times, but now there are those who will take care of him. The girls continue to hover around Jake, looking at his bruised finger. Audrey hands Jake some macaroni, telling him it's delicious and inviting him to try it. Dismas and his gang continue to be outraged that Audrey feeds Jake his pasta. The main character says that the pasta tastes good, but he doesn't like red ones. Audrey examines the macaron and corrects Jake, telling him that the macaron is actually pink. Junior gets angry, telling Jake to eat his breakfast and not look at Audrey. Audrey stands up, whispering something inappropriate in Jake's ear, making him blush. Dismas cannot stand the intensity of passions, and blood begins to flow from his nose. Jake's friends read the news feed on social networks, saying that Jake is now in the news and they want to interview him. Jake, not wanting any more attention, runs away, leaving his friends alone. Audrey and Unia blame each other for Jake leaving, saying that Unia is a gossip and Audrey provoked Jake with her lecherous behavior. Jake is hiding from the reporters, hoping they won't follow him, when suddenly his phone rings. Streamer Chai Chai writes to Jake, saying that she is flying into the city at 7 p.m., and asks to meet her. Jake rejoices at the new opportunity to spend money, and happily looks forward to meeting Chai Chai. In the evening at the airport, Jake looks for the streamer, suspecting that after all, she turned on the filters and in real life turned out to be an old woman whom he does not recognize. Suddenly he hears streamer Chai Chai being grabbed by the hand by one of the fans, offering to accompany her and give her a ride. Seeing the girl struggling, Jake realizes that this is the same streamer. Jake stands up for Chai Chai, telling the fan to check his eyes, because the expression on her face shows that she does not want to go with him. Chai Chai recognizes Jake, saying that his clothes are the same as in the description of the social network in which they corresponded. Chai Chai thanks Jake for his help, saying that if he had not arrived on time, that fan would have kidnapped her. Chai Chai says that she did not expect Jake to be young and handsome, because she imagined that such a rich man would be much older and scarier. A mysterious voice in the hero's head says that a counterattack mode against Chai Chai has been launched, showing her engagement level at 30%. A well-dressed rich man appears in the crowd, waving Chai Chai and calling his name. Chai Chai recognizes the man, calling him Damien, asking how he ended up here. Chai Chai introduces Jake, calling him by his nickname on the platform, saying that this is the same rich man under the nickname Beggar. Damien is surprised that the sensational rich man is so young and asks Jake what he drives. Jake says he drives a small scooter instead of a car, stunning Chai Chai. Damien offers to give Chai Chai and Jake a ride, packing his scooter on the roof of his expensive car. While driving, Damien reflects that Jake looks to be in his twenties and wears fairly inexpensive clothes. Chai Chai also doubts Jake's wealth, wondering whether this man is really that rich. Damien's car makes a stop near an expensive hotel. Chai Chai opens the door and greets all the people, blinding everyone with a bright smile. Chai Chai's guests greet her, saying that she has become even more beautiful since her last appearance in public. Jake guesses that all these apologies and invitations to the bar were a way to gather all the top donors in one place. Jake notes that as a famous Leopards 2 streamer, Chai Chai is obviously very smart. The guests sit down at the table and discuss business while one of the donors asks if Jake really came to meet him. One of the men says that if Jake had enough money for 2,000 gifts, then his income is clearly at least 10 billion. The man sits closer to Jake, saying that he knows quite a few people in the city. However, as he notes, he never saw Jake or his parents on the lists of the richest people in this city. The guests begin to suspect Jake of faking, saying that he must have deceived Chai Chai. According to the mysterious voice in Jake's head, the fact that he doesn't answer anything reduces Chai Chai's enthusiasm by 10%. Chai Chai remembers that she looked at his phone on the way, so she has no doubt that Jake is who he says he is, which means that most likely he is still taking revenge on her. Chai Chai puts her hand on Jake's thigh, saying that according to her rumors, 
Jake's family is one of the three richest families in the capital. Jake replies that he doesn't know the people Chai Chai is talking about, but he clearly has more money than them. Chai Chai's guests do not believe Jake, saying that if he has more money than the family they mistakenly thought was Jake's family, then he must have hidden a couple of cars and is not showing them. Jake hugs Chai Chai, holding her close, saying that he does not have a single car. Jake asks Chai Chai which car is her favorite because he can buy her any one right now. The guests are indignant at the fact that Jake is frivolously spreading his arms, and they tell him that he is a show-off in all his glory. Chai Chai sweetly responds to Jake, saying that she really likes the Ferrari F A60, but according to the voice in Jake's head, her passion level has dropped again by 15%. Jake understands that she is only joyful on the outside, but disappointed on the inside, and this performance will drive him crazy. Jake says he understands, gets up from the table and leaves. Half an hour later, Chai Chai goes outside with her fans, assuming that Jake must have chickened out and is disappointed that he turned out to be a deceiver. Suddenly, the milestone is blinded by the bright light of headlights and the roar of engines, and the guests, along with Chai Chai, cover their eyes with their hands, not understanding what is happening. It turns out that Jake drove a huge pile of luxury supercars of various brands to the hotel. Jake apologizes for blocking the guests' cars, explaining that the owner of the car service, Walter, drove all the cars he chose at once, and Walter, in turn, says that Jake's identity is confirmed by a special diamond card. Guests cannot believe their eyes, saying that for a black diamond card the owner's wealth must be at least a billion. Jake says that the car Chai Chai wanted cost 15 million yuan, which is too cheap for him. According to Jake, Walter said that Chai Chai would like the LF model, so he decided to take the initiative and bought her this car. Walter tells Jake that the car is worth 32 million yuan, to which he, without further ado, swipes the card at the cash register to pay for the purchase. Chai Chai blushes, surprised that Jake actually bought her a car for over 30 million yuan. All the guests stand rooted to the spot, saying with heaviness that they had just made fun of Jake in vain. While Chai Chai inspects the new car, Jake talks to Walter, saying that he wants to buy a car that is more expensive than the most expensive one in his showroom. Full of gratitude, Chai Chai tells Jake that she has always dreamed of driving that Ferrari. Jake replies that he has so much money anyway that he needs to spend it somewhere. Chai Chai is impressed that Jake didn't take advantage of the situation and demand nothing in return, and a voice in his head reports that her level of infatuation has increased by 50%. The guests apologize to Jake, saying that they should not have dared to doubt his power and one of them says that he has the largest fleet of vehicles in the city at his disposal, and if Jake wants to buy one of them, he will be given a big discount. Chai Chai comes up to Jake, says that he wants to try out the car, and asks him to join him. Ti Chai hints in Jake's ear that she is grateful for big gifts, and since his gift is too big, she will thank him several times when they are alone. Jake thinks to himself that now he understands why she makes so much money from streaming, and now she has piqued his curiosity. Having got into the car, Chai Chai presses the pedal to the floor, and with a loud roar the car takes off and drives off into the horizon. Chai Chai gives Jake a marker, asking him to write a signature on her thigh. Jake lifts Chai Chai's skirt, which has an apology written on it. Chai Chai says that this is one of her thanks, and every time she thanks him, he can leave a mark on her thigh. Chai Chai turns on the stream, saying that unexpectedly for her, Jake bought her a car without further ado and she is very touched by this. While Chai Chai is chatting with his followers, the owner of the car park talks to Jake, saying that there is a club of rich people in the city who really want to meet him. Having accepted the invitation, Jake receives a call on his phone and is informed that students from his school have organized a reunion, and he is invited to attend. Jake is also informed that a beauty from the literature class named Astrid will come to the party, and Jake says that she will definitely come. Jake arrives at the appointed place on his scooter and looks around carefully saying that the five-star bar looks very rich. Jake is called out by his classmates, whom he asks about where the parking is, to which they answer that they came on foot. Suddenly, Jake's scooter begins to skid in place and comes out and finally breaks down. Jake remembers that yesterday Damien asked Jake for his scooter and wanted to ride it somewhere. Jake says that it was probably Damien who broke him and that he should ask him to make amends. Suddenly, an expensive convertible with one of his classmates driving up to Jake. A classmate's name is Fox, and he asks Jake what happened to his car. Fox laughs, 
saying that when he chose the meeting place, he didn't expect anyone to show up on a scooter. Fox throws the doorman his car keys, asking him to park his car, to which a surprised classmate says that a parking space here would cost several million, but is told that Fox owns this bar called Mirden, where the meeting is being organized. Jake says he'll find somewhere to park while the others go explore Mirden. While Jake is driving his broken scooter, his phone starts ringing. It turned out that Audrey was calling him, asking where he was and offering to go somewhere together. Jake tells Audrey that he won't be able to today, because he's at a high school reunion, to which Audrey replies that he can tomorrow, but in a couple of days he won't. Jake silently assumes that Audrey's period is coming in a couple of days, so she won't be able to go on a date, so he tells her to drink warm water, slightly increasing her enthusiasm. A voice in his head tells Jake that Audrey's infatuation level has reached 91%, and level 1 of the counterattack has been completed, which means that 10% of the money spent on her is credited to his personal account. In addition, the voice informs Jake that all of his characteristics have been increased by one level and several skills have become available to him. Jake gains the ability to appreciate cultural heritage, use five electric whips and rap, which somewhat disappoints him due to the low practicality of these skills. Jake returns to Mirden, thinking that it's time to buy himself a car. But, unfortunately, he cannot spend the counterattack budget on himself. When Jake arrives at his classmate's room, only two seats are left free. Jake asks if Astrid has arrived yet, to which Fox arrogantly asks why he cares, because she is a student in the literature class from a difficult family. Jake wonders if Astrid's family is very rich, to which his classmate remarks that her family is very intelligent and does not talk about their wealth. Fox says that Astrid's family opened a city museum, so Jake is with her on completely different levels, because only Fox has enough money to look after her. At the same time, the door of the room opens and Astrid enters the room, apologizing for being late, saying that she was stuck in traffic. According to the voice in her head, Astrid's appearance score is 94, which pleasantly surprises Jake. Fox invites Astrid to sit next to him, but the only empty seat is next to Jake, who also tells her that she can sit next to him. Astrid accepts his offer and sits next to him, saying that she hasn't seen Jake for a long time. Jake is surprised, saying that he thought she had already forgotten his name, to which Astrid replies that she remembers the names of everyone in her class. His classmates are surprised that Astrid is sitting with Jake while a mysterious voice in his head shows him Astrid's characteristics. But now the conditions have changed and if Jake's infatuation reaches 100%, the card will no longer belong to him. Fox is annoyed that Astrid did not accept his proposal and curses Jake for his impudence. He gloatingly asks Jake why he didn't bring the girl he dated for three years to the meeting. Jake responds to Fox, saying that he broke up with his girlfriend the day before yesterday, to which they scream that he is only saying this because he needs Astrid. Jake's classmates continue to pester him, saying that they didn't expect him to become a jerk after college, despite his words that he doesn't lie. From the senseless farce over her own person, Astrid's level of passion drops by 1%. Jake is surprised by this, trying to figure out what to do in this situation. Fox decides to try his luck again, and turns to Astrid, telling her that he recently bought a late Maria from Da Vinci from a collector from Shanghai. Astrid turns to look at the painting behind her, and Fox encourages her to take a closer look at it. Astrid walks over to the painting to get a better look, and Fox walks around the table stopping next to Jake. Fox puts his hand on his shoulder and whispers to him to know his place, calling him a beggar and threatening that if he tries to suck up to Astrid again, he will destroy his entire career. Fox begins to tell Astrid how much he likes this painting, and that in a few days there will be an auction in the city where another similar painting will be sold. Astrid is surprised, saying that she did not know that Fox was interested in Renaissance artists, to which Fox, meanwhile, silently declares to himself that although he spent a lot of time studying her hobbies, he does not consider them interesting at all. Jake gets up from his seat and says that he, too, is very interested in da Vinci's paintings. Smiling, he says that they can look at the painting together, while the voice in his head activates the artifact evaluation skill. Fox agrees with Jake's proposal, thinking to himself that this fool is about to disgrace himself. While Jake is looking at the painting, Fox asks him to share his opinion about this painting. Without thinking twice, Jake concludes that this painting is nothing more than a fake. He explains that in his later works, 
da Vinci favored a technique of subtle overpainting, with each brush stroke having a translucent effect, and he also liked to shade the corners of the eyes and mouth. Astrid listens carefully to Jake's analytical reasoning, her mouth slightly open in surprise. Having finished his analysis, Jake says that, unfortunately, Fox bought a fake. Fox, gritting his teeth, says that a layman might have believed his words, but he immediately saw that he had picked up some semi-impoverished expert skills on the internet. However, Astrid stands up for Jake, saying that she studied da Vinci's paintings and agrees with the conclusions voiced. Fox and other classmates cannot believe what is happening and are frozen in amazement. Astrid turns to Jake, wondering how he has such expert knowledge. Jake replies that since childhood he has learned a lot about appreciating cultural relics and art objects, because he has the goal of buying back all the cultural artifacts of China and returning them to their homeland. Fox laughs, saying that he almost believed Jake's bravado that he would be able to buy back all the valuable artifacts, to which the main character says that as long as he has a certain amount of money, there is nothing that he cannot buy. Everyone bursts into laughter, saying that they don't believe his school book boasts about their wealth. Astrid dryly notes that as a child she had the same unrealistic dreams, but the degree of her passion increases by 5%. Jake confidently replies that the dream statement is too far, and it is just a goal that he will definitely achieve. Astrid sits down in the same seat next to Jake, making Fox angry at him. Fox gradually becomes enraged thinking to himself that he needs to show the poor man his rightful place for trying to steal Astrid from him. It's time for lunch, and the guests are amazed at how luxurious and different each of them has food. Fox responds that his chef decides what to serve because he used to work in a three-star Michelin restaurant, so the dish depends on his mood when cooking. Looking at Jake's dish, Fox grins that, unfortunately, he was unlucky. Fox laughs at Jake, asking how he likes the chef's steamed buns, adding that if he doesn't like it, the dish can be replaced, but it will take a few hours. Jake doesn't really notice Fox and his cheap jokes and continues to communicate with Astrid, continuing to piss him off. Jake shares yet another knowledge of art loaded into his head, further increasing the degree of Astrid's passion. Suddenly, Jake's phone starts buzzing and he receives a message that Damien invites him to the Princely Millions chat. Entering the chat, Jake decides to spend money and finds a chat user named Smiling Marie sending her 18 million yen. One of the chat users says that his name is Fox, and he is the young owner of the Mirden bar and invites him to his bar, saying that he will pay for everything he orders there. Jake notes to himself that this is an incredibly wonderful coincidence and agrees, to which other chat participants report that they will also come to Mirden. Fox is happy that he has made another rich and influential friend and when everyone arrives, he can easily get rid of Jake. According to his plan, all that will have to be done is to complain about him in the presence of influential rich people and his new powerful friend. In his dreams, everyone will immediately side with him and throw Jake out of town, closing his opportunity to work anywhere. Fox gets up from the table, inviting everyone to the karaoke room, saying that he has arranged a meeting with the rich, so everyone will have the opportunity to communicate with people of the upper class. After some time, the first rich people begin to arrive at the meeting in the karaoke room talking with Fox. Fox introduces Astrid to Mr. Shu, who is the main property owner in the city, to which he says that he knew her father. Astrid greets politely, and Mr. Shu says that he heard that Mrs. Astrid is unusually beautiful, and it turned out to be true. During the conversations, one of the bartenders approaches Fox, asking for a moment of his time. According to the bartender, Jake would like to order a bottle of Aurora Russo sherry wine, and he is not sure if he should open it for him. Fox is loudly surprised, asking Jake if he really wants to order this bottle. Jake's classmates warn him that the wine costs thousands of dollars, and he clearly doesn't know how expensive it is. However, Jake answers without a shadow of a doubt that he really wants to order it, saying that one of his rich acquaintances will pay for it. Fox rejoices, thinking that this is his chance, saying that if Jake really has a rich acquaintance, then he can open the bottle. Fox opens the bottle telling Jake that one of these costs 250000 and if his friend cannot pay, then the main character will have to mine coal to pay off the debts. Jake says that he really doesn't know much about wine, noting to himself that it seemed to him that the price directly depended on the length of the name. Fox responds to Jake by saying that he will be more careful when his hands get dirty, and then he will think more before buying something. 
Fox looks around the karaoke room, saying that everyone has almost arrived. His new acquaintance, nicknamed Rich Man, is still not visible, despite the fact that he reported that he was in Mirden. One of the guests reports that Bogak wrote in the chat that he is already in the karaoke room, while the door opens and the last guest arrives. The latest guest is the owner of the largest fleet in the city from a recent meeting with Chai Chai named Matt. Matt runs past Fox without even saying hello. Matt greets Jake, apologizing for being late and declaring that he'll have three drinks for him. Everyone in the room freezes in amazement, trying to comprehend what they have seen, while Fox cannot even turn around from shock. After a short pause, everyone except Matt and Astrid, who is not very interested in what is happening, shouts out Jake's nickname, not believing their eyes. Fox turns his head to Jake with difficulty, his mouth open in surprise, saying that this is impossible. Jake, smiling slightly, replies that it is still possible, and it really is him. Jake is surrounded by rich people, admiring that he is so young and rich, asking if he has a girlfriend. His classmates are perplexed that Jake is so rich that a bunch of tycoons are fawning over him. Fox shouts that this is all some kind of deception, because he knows Jake's parents, and they are ordinary workers, and he is an ordinary poor dog. Matt tells Fox to shut his mouth immediately, and that he's the worst of the group. Matt reminds Fox that he is the uneducated and incapable member of their club who spends nothing but the hundreds of thousands of dollars a month his parents give him. Matt also adds that he lost money on the stock without making a penny, which is a shame for their group. Matt concludes his speech by not understanding how Fox just laughs at Mr. Rich. Everyone decides that the only way out and punishment will be Fox's expulsion from the club of princely millions. However, Jake saves the situation by saying that nothing bad happened, and Mr. Fox said that he will pay all his expenses for today and asks to serve the most expensive drinks. Jake adds that guests can order anything and everything will be free for them, sparking their joy. After some time, evening comes, and Mrs. Astrid's car drives up to Mirden. Astrid says goodbye to everyone, saying that she is leaving home. Jake and her classmates look at her, saying that despite the fact that Astrid is very rich, she does not flaunt any of it. Jake reflects on her thinking that she is a real lady who has been part of high society since childhood and was not at all surprised by Jake's wealth, even without increasing her level of infatuation. In Jake's opinion, she is an ideal object for spending his money. Matt approaches Jake talking about finding him an $80 million car. Matt adds that there are only 10 of these cars in the world, and they are not even in China, to which Jake replies that he likes this car and is buying it. Matt says he will take care of it, and in a few days the car will be here and running off about its business. Jake checks his personal account balance, finding that there is only 1 million yuan in it, thinking that it would be better to spend a lot of money on the next counterattacks. Late in the evening, Jake returns home, noticing Yunia sitting on the street, and asks her what she is doing there. Yunia looks very scared and upset, happy that Jake is finally back. Junia says her father had a heart attack and is in the hospital, adding that the operation cost 800,000 yuan, which is unaffordable for her family. Jake does not believe Yunia, saying that after three years he already knows all her excuses, and she will probably spend these 800,000 on something, so he will not give her a penny. Junia, hysterically, reproaches Jake for spending more than 10 million dollars on Audrey, but now he cannot lend her 800,000, to which he says that she cannot tell him what and who to spend his own money on. Junior continues to rebuke Jake, telling him that they broke up less than a week ago, to which he replies that thanks to this, he began to have a normal life, and he does not want to ruin his mood by talking to her. Junior says Jake can't do this to her, and a voice in Jake's head tells him that her crush has dropped by 20%. Jake reflects that despite his hopes, she hasn't changed one bit, and he still isn't going to spend any more money on her. The next morning, Jake walks near his university and reads his messages, learning that Chai Chai has invited him to dinner. Having entered the streaming platform, he turns to the assistant, he receives a notification that Chai Chai is broadcasting and an offer to make an exclusive gift to order. Jake likes the idea and decides to think about what kind of gift he wants to give. When Jake enters Chai Chai's stream, a notification arrives in the chat, and Chai Chai greets him along with the rest of the viewers. Jake gives Chai Chai a gift from the God of Luck, which is custom made to his order and costs $880,000. Jake continues to shower Chai Chai with money, buying dozens of these gifts, 
Jake stops only when he gives Chai Chai a total of 300 million yuan, raising her level of infatuation by another 20%. Embarrassed, Chai Chai says that he will do whatever Jake wants, but he leaves the airwaves without asking for anything. Chai Chai does not understand why this happened and briefly freezes motionless in surprise. Jake rejoices, realizing that 10% of the 300 million spent on Chai Chai has been transferred to his account. Chai Chai, meanwhile, is tormented by the thought that Jake did not ask for anything in return and makes a bold guess that Jake may be in love with her. Shaking off these thoughts, Chai Chai tells herself that men are unreliable, and he is just her wallet, so she shouldn't fall in love with him back. Jake approaches the school and takes out his phone when he suddenly hears someone swearing on the street. A group of guys stop Junia, tearing off her mask, telling her not to leave them. Junia casts a helpless glance at Jake, but he indifferently walks away, abandoning her. Yunia tells the guys that she has no money now and asks them to give her three more days, but they only get angrier. One of the extortionists remembers Yunia that she said that her boyfriend would lend her money and asks where he is. The extortionists begin to mock Yunia, saying that since her boyfriend did not come to her aid, he is a weakling and a scoundrel. The extortionists decide to kidnap Yunia, grabbing her by the arms and surrounding her, not paying attention to her attempts to escape. Yunia once again tries to escape, but the extortionists grab her and gag her before she can scream. Yunia looks towards the only witness, begging for help with her eyes, but he runs away. As the kidnappers drag her into the car, Yunia thinks about Jake, saying to herself that she doesn't blame him for leaving her. According to Yunia, this is all her fault, and if she had not been so selfish, she would not have ended up in this situation. And the kidnappers close the car door and prepare to leave. Suddenly, someone breaks through the car window with their hand, hitting the driver hard on the cheek. Junia's savior turns out to be Jake, who opens the car and orders the kidnappers to get out of it. Junia is overjoyed at her rescue, and her level of passion increases by 40%. The hooligans jump out of the car and, shouting that Jake is apparently tired of living, rush at him with their fists. Jake takes out thick wads of money and hits each of the bullies on the head, knocking them to the ground. The bullies try to get up while Jake stands in front of them with a bag full of money. Jake tells them to take their money and get out, giving them a dirty look. The kidnappers pick up the money and bag, counting the bills, asking Jake if he is Junia's boyfriend. Jake gives the villains a negative answer and reminds them to get lost quickly. The criminals throw Junia out of the car, saying that Jake will have to pay for the fight he caused. Loudly slamming the door of the minibus, the car moves off, leaving Jake and Junia alone. Yunia sits on the sidewalk, saying that she is really sorry that everything turned out like this. Jake indifferently replies that if she is truly sorry and believes that she is wrong, then she better not pester him anymore. Jake walks away and Junia thinks to herself that she doesn't deserve him and promises to atone for her guilt and all the pain she caused him during this time. Jake goes to a meeting in a taxi, watching another streamer, attracting the attention of the driver who tells him that some rich man recently sent 300 million to one streamer. Jake replies that he saw it too, continuing to poke at his phone with interest. On the built-in screen in the taxi driver's car, an inscription appears that a user under the nickname Beggar has just sent 100 million to another streamer on the Medusa platform. Jake thinks out loud that he should see how much money he has left, and the driver does not understand why the main character watched the broadcast and got out just a few minutes later. The driver assumes that Jake is doing this for the sake of bonuses for entering the platform every day, and advises him not to spend money on ether, because this can make him poor. Suddenly, the driver notices another piece of news that the beggar has just sent another 100 million to another streamer, after which he turns to Jake and sees him commenting out loud about his decisions. From the realization that he is carrying in the car a man with the largest fortune in the world, the driver twitches, barely staying on the road. Jake arrives at the meeting place while the driver is perplexed that he was carrying the same rich man. Jake is happy that he successfully spent another 300 million, thinking about throwing bait everywhere to get a big catch. Jake walks down the street, looking at landmarks to understand where he needs to go. After a long journey, Jake arrives in Nam Jong village and looks for the place where Audrey invited him to have dinner. Arriving at the right address, Jake sees Audrey greeting him, happy that he has finally arrived. Jake is embarrassed by the sight of Audrey's loungewear and briefly falls into a stupor, but she quickly grabs his hand and leads him inside. Jake enters Audrey's apartment, 
looking around with interest. Audrey smiles sweetly and asks Jake if he likes what he sees, meaning his apartment. Jake replies that everything looks great, but he means Audrey's clothes. Audrey sits Jake down at the table, telling him that she prepared dinner herself and asks him to try it. Jake enjoys dinner while Audrey tells him that he is the first guy to be in this apartment and eats what she cooked. Audrey also shows Jake a lilac flower, to which he replies that it is a great honor for him. Audrey tells Jake that she decided to buy it because she found out that he really likes the smell of this flower. Jake is surprised by Audrey's behavior, thinking that he did not expect such tenderness and care from her, expecting from her the same selfishness as from Unia. Jake puts his hand to Audrey's forehead, asking if she's okay and if she has a fever. Audrey takes Jake's hand and says that due to her parents' early divorce, she grew up to be a very insecure person. Audrey shares her personal experiences saying that she grew up with the idea that people are very fickle, and only money gave her a basic sense of security. Audrey hugs Jake, saying that she could not even imagine that she would feel so calm with him like never before due to the fact that he is completely different from those guys who usually chase her. Audrey admits to Jake that she is in love with him, and although she always tried to protect herself before, now she is not afraid of anything. Jake remembers that Audrey's infatuation rate is 91%, which means she is in love with him, thereby explaining her kindness and tenderness. Deciding to take advantage of the opportunity, Jake lays Audrey on the bed, hovering over her and pressing himself against her body. Audrey languidly whispers that her clothes are a little in her way, hinting that Jake would continue, but they are both distracted by a loud scream from the street. Jake recognizes the voice of his friend Harry in this scream and goes to the window to check what is happening. Jake sees Harry following his girlfriend Nana, asking her not to leave and admitting he was wrong. Nana slaps Harry hard, knocking his glasses to the ground. She starts swearing at Harry, shaming him for shouting and attracting people's attention. As she leaves, she adds that now that everyone already knows about it, he can continue to scream. Harry bends down to the ground, trying to feel his glasses. Jake approaches his friend, asking what's going on, handing him his glasses. Harry begins to tell Jake that he and Nana were dating, but is distracted by Audrey approaching Jake. Harry is very surprised to meet Audrey and her appearance. Jake brings Harry back to his story, saying that they were going to have dinner together and asks him to continue. Harry shares details about how he was supposed to go to the movies with Nana, but she got angry at him for refusing to buy an anti-wrinkle kit because Harry didn't have any money at the time. Audrey looks over Jake's shoulder at Harry and says she heard Nana recently got a rich boyfriend. Jake and Harry don't believe what they heard and Harry says that Nana couldn't betray him. Audrey notes that despite the fact that they do not believe what they hear, usually the news from her friends does not turn out to be false. Jake offers to help Harry and asks Audrey to ask her girlfriends if they have seen Nana's new boyfriend. Jake invites Harry to check the true nature of his ex-girlfriend. Fox, tormented by heavy thoughts, nervously smokes while lying in his bed. His girlfriend hugs him, asking him about the reason for his anxiety to which he replies that his life may never be the same. Fox talks about how he was almost kicked out of an influential club, but fortunately, Jake helped him and he was able to stay. However, now no one is paying attention to Fox's messages, and if this continues, he will fall into the depths of hell. Suddenly Fox's phone starts buzzing and he decides to check what happened, but he quickly starts typing with a shocked face. It turned out that Jake asked in the Princely Millions chat if someone owned a shopping center, to which Fox replied that he had just the right one, thereby getting a chance to restore his reputation. The next day, Fox is driving with his girlfriend and says that they will pick up Jake to discuss the plan and explore the surroundings. Fox pulls up to a small outdoor cafe, saying that they have arrived and Mr. Rich must be here somewhere. Fox's girlfriend is excited that she will be able to meet the legendary rich man by looking for him in the crowd. They find Jake at one of the tables, calmly eating breakfast in ordinary clothes. Fox's girlfriend is surprised that Jake looks absolutely homely, while Fox watches him enthusiastically. Fox and his girlfriend greet Jake, surprised that he is having breakfast in such a cheap cafe, to which Jake says that it is very tasty and recommends this place, after which they set off, discussing the details of the plan. After some time, the plan comes to fruition, and Harry asks Nana to wait at the gate to check if she really was secretly dating another person. After some time, an older man approaches Nana and kisses her, which makes Harry fall into despair. Harry approaches Nana and her man, 
shouting that he can't believe Nana betrayed her for some old man. The man mocks Harry, saying that he must be the poor guy Nana was talking about. Harry tells the old man to fuck off, to which he continues to scoff and calls the guard to throw him out. The guard approaches Harry asking him to leave, to which Harry tries to explain that this is his girlfriend and she is cheating on him. Nana hugs the man, calling him Walter, saying that he is her boyfriend. Harry falls into despair, telling her that he doesn't believe in her betrayal for the sake of a six-month relationship for the sake of some old man out of nowhere. Nana says that Walter is a VIP client of the club and a millionaire, and she is not going to suffer by being his girlfriend. Harry doesn't believe his ears, looking at them dejectedly, saying that this can't be true. Suddenly, Fox drives up to the group in his car, stopping not far from them. Walter says he knows Fox, calling him the owner of the mall, much to Nana's delight. Fox walks towards Walter and Nana, who tells Walter that they probably want to say hello to him. However, Fox passes by them and hugs Harry in a friendly manner, asking him if he was here to check the work of the shopping center. Fox hopes Harry will reconsider his investment because he has two more shopping centers to develop and is looking forward to working with him. Nana and Walter stare at Fox and Harry, not believing that Harry could be such a big investor. Suddenly, Fox's girlfriend appears from the crowd and calls Harry, coquettishly accusing him of making people wait for him for so long. She quickly approaches Harry, clinging to him, sweetly cooing that he promised to buy him a new bag from Bali from the exclusive spring collection. Nana doesn't believe her words, saying that Harry couldn't even buy her cosmetics for several thousand, to which the girl tells her that she doesn't look worthy of Harry buying her anything. Harry turns around and sees Jake in the crowd, who is carefully watching what is happening, leaning against the wall. Harry is happy to himself that Jake brought all these people to help him in this difficult situation. Harry says he was supposed to check on them all, but Walter stopped him by threatening and bullying him. Fox becomes theatrically enraged, telling the security guard that this is disgraceful to his mall and asks for the top manager to take away Walter's VIP status and fine him two million for breach of contract. Walter, without thinking twice, throws Nana away, apologizing to Harry and saying that it was all a misunderstanding and he knew nothing about it, asking for mercy. Harry and Fox mock Walter and Nana, telling the manager to have the two of them blacklisted from them all forever. Walter and Nana fall to their knees, begging Harry not to do this. Harry imitates Walter, saying that at his age if he falls, he might not be able to get back up. Walter says his company is known throughout the city and he has many other connections besides Fox. When Walter tries to leave, expensive sports cars drive up to the shopping center en masse, preventing them from leaving. Members of the club of princely millions get out of their cars and greet each other with humor. Nana and Walter are surprised by what is happening, not understanding what some of the richest people in the city are doing here. The rich people surround Harry, playing along with him and Fox, feigning upset that only Fox helped Harry, to which he tells them that this man was the cause of the problem, pointing to Walter. The crowd turns to Walter, giving him a dozen threatening glances. Walter falls into despair, realizing that everything is over for him, and thinks to himself that now he is completely lost. Harry thanks Jake for his help, to which he replies that gratitude is unnecessary, because he is his friend and was obliged to help. Harry asks Jake how he has so many rich acquaintances to which he tells a hastily made-up story that these are all actors at Fox's beck and call. Harry and Jake say goodbye, and Harry promises to bring Jake his favorite food from the cafeteria that evening. The rich people of the city stand and watch Jake in admiration, but one lady with green hair and a blue dress stands out from the whole crowd. Jake warmly thanks all the participants for their help and offers to treat everyone to hot and spicy food. Fox hugs Jake, offering to go up to his bar on the seventh floor while the crowd asks Jake to pay for them, which he calmly agrees to. The group sits down at a bar and discusses how Jake donated 100 million each to three streamers, thereby doubling the number of registered users. During conversations about Jake, one of the rich men turns to the green-haired woman, calling her Marie and asking why she is silent and continues to drink. The man tells Marie that her project is too expensive and technically complex, so she should listen to her father's advice. Marie puts the glass on the table, angrily saying that the word surrender is not in her dictionary. According to her, since her friends cannot lend her money and are completely afraid of her father, she will be forced to turn to Mr. Jake. Meanwhile, rich people try to invite Jake to their own events, offering him their own nightclubs, 
yacht parties or poker games. Jake listens to their proposals without much enthusiasm, with poorly concealed boredom on his face. Jake politely refuses all offers, citing the fact that he would rather spend money than gamble. Marie hears Jake's words and approaches him, saying that if he likes spending money, then that's a good thing. Marie puts her hand on Jake's chest, asking if he could invest in her. The guests swear at Marie, saying that she's at it again, and asking Jake not to listen to her, because her startup is a failure. Jake, however, shows interest in Marie's proposal, asking what he needs to spend the money on. A mysterious voice in Jake's head reads Marie's familiar data, while she tells him that she is creating industrial chips. The rich men approach Jake, again warning that Marie's idea is just a pipe dream. Marie replies that her idea is not impossible, and they only need to solve a few technical problems to achieve a breakthrough. Marie again asks Jake what he thinks about investing in her project, thinking to herself that he will most likely refuse. Jake responds that industrial chips are a great idea because the U.S. is ahead of China in this area and investing in this area will help in the fight against the Americans. Marie is surprised by Jake's abrupt agreement, asking if he is going to investigate her company to know the likelihood of success. Jake replies that he doesn't need to do any research, so he'll just transfer her 500 million. Marie checks her phone, which receives a notification about the money received. Jake adds that even if the project fails, he will not make claims. Marie is encouraged by Jake's belief in her project, increasing her passion for it by 20%. The guests are surprised by what happened, suspecting that Jake has fallen in love with Marie and is trying to buy her smile with these millions. Marie remains shocked by Jake's generosity while he decides to quickly sneak out of the event. Running out of the building, Jake tells himself that this is all too expensive, because he would have to spend money from his personal account, and besides, he didn't really want to treat them. The next morning, Marie tells her friend what happened, saying that she still can't believe it. Marie's friend turns out to be Astrid, who congratulates Marie for solving the biggest financial problem of her business journey. Maria recalls how her father forbids her to do business without even listening to her, threatening to block her card. She also remembers how all her relatives refused to help her because of her father's orders. Filled with determination, Marie tells herself that she must succeed, and Astrid tells her that she believes in her. Marie tells Astrid that she talks about herself too much, and asks her how her homecoming went. Astrid replies that the meeting was supposed to proceed as usual, but she was surprised by one of her classmates by demonstrating knowledge of the art that was on par with her masters. Marie and Astrid exchange jokes about their interest in the unexpected men who have appeared in their lives. The conversation between the two friends is interrupted by Astrid's mother entering the room and telling her that it is time to go. Astrid's face changes, instantly becoming gloomy, letting out a sad sigh. Astrid's mother reminds her that Mr. Mark represents his family, who are the future shareholders of this museum, so she needs to get closer to him. Astrid sadly listens to her mother's instructions, telling her that she understood everything. On the morning of the same day, Jake comes home to his dorm and hears the call of his friend Wu. When Jake asks what happened, Wu replies that he has caught a cold and asks him to relieve him for the day. Jake agrees without any problem, asking where his uniform is, opening his closet of clothes. Jake puts on his uniform and remembers that Wu works as a security guard on the night shift at a museum. Jake leaves, jokingly asking Wu not to go too far. Arriving at the museum, Jake, a few hours later, notes that there are quite a few visitors today and decides to spend some money on streamers. Suddenly an expensive car drives up to the museum, and a rich man gets out in the company of an assistant. The museum's secretary greets Mr. Mark, saying that Astrid's family is already waiting for him upstairs. The group passes by Jake, who doesn't notice them, sitting on his phone and watching streamers. Mark greets Jake rudely and loudly, frightening the secretary with his suddenness. Mark throws a fit, asking if they hired a blind man to work at the museum, adding that Jake didn't even get up to greet him. Jake apologizes to Mark and stands up to greet him as the secretary explains that Jake is only a temporary worker and a college student. The assistant scoffs at Jake, saying that, judging by his face, he can't do anything other than work as a security guard, and Mark adds that his apology seems insincere. Jake says don't just look at a person's appearance before judging them. Mark loses his temper again, telling Jake that he is a rogue, so he cannot tell him such things, demanding from the secretary that Jake will not be here tomorrow. The secretary says that, unfortunately, they are already short-staffed. Mark rudely interrupts him, 
saying that he would remove Jake immediately. Mark goes upstairs with his secretary and his assistant, while Jake remembers that this museum most likely belongs to Astrid's family. Astrid's family greets Mark's delegation in full force, saying that they were looking forward to seeing him. Mark and Astrid's father shake hands, and the father of the family thanks Mark for wanting to do his part to preserve history. The father of the family asks Astrid to show Mark the museum, to which she agrees without much enthusiasm. As Astrid passes by her father, he whispers to her that Mr. Mark's investment is very important, and he is counting on her. Astrid calmly approaches Mark, asking him to follow her, adding that she will show him the treasures of this museum. Astrid and Mark approach the painting, and she tells him that in front of them is the only surviving painting with calligraphy of the god of poetry. Inspired by what she saw, Astrid says that if you look at the picture carefully, you can even feel the emotions of the poet who wrote this poem in the brushstrokes. Not really listening to Astrid's story, Mark frivolously places his hand on her shoulder. Mark apologizes to Astrid, saying that she is so beautiful that he could not resist, to which she shouts that Mark obviously has no interest in these artifacts. Mark replies that he spends money on whatever he wants and doesn't need any interest for it. Astrid says that if Mark knew even a little about this, he would know that these artifacts are not worth their money, wondering why his father even agreed to invest on his part. Mark tells Astrid's father that he is not crazy about the museum, but will buy it for $600 million, but on the condition that Astrid marries him. Astrid's family, shocked, tells Mark that such a condition is excessive. Astrid angrily tells Mark that there is no way she will marry him. Astrid asks her parents to send Mark away, but the amount of $600 million is a weighty argument for them. Astrid's father says that after two consecutive years of losses, her museum is on the verge of bankruptcy, and Mr. Mark is here not to invest in the museum, but to buy it. Astrid cannot believe what is happening, while Mark says that he is their last hope, assuring that Astrid will have a better life if she marries him. Astrid tries to reason with her family, but her father and mother say that they didn't want this. But this is the only way not to go broke. Parents tell Astrid that in this case, most of the artifacts will be bought up by dealers and collectors at low prices, or end up on the black market. And Astrid remembers how her father showed her various artifacts as a child, admiring her talent and passion for them. Astrid recalls how, since childhood, she did not like rich people who did not value these artifacts and looked at them only as a way to show off. Astrid always did not understand other people's desire for a luxurious life, believing that there were many things in this world that money could not buy. However, seeing how her parents are selling her and the museum with priceless artifacts for $600 million, she realizes that her ideas about life are naive fantasies. Mark says that Astrid should not worry, because he will treat her very well after the wedding, and if she gives him a son, he will even buy her another museum. Realizing the hopelessness of the situation, Astrid says that she understands everything. The desperate parents thank Astrid, saying that she has grown so much during this time and offers to sign the contract right now. According to the secretary, this contract comes into force from the moment it is signed by both parties and cannot be changed, to which Astrid's father replies that she will be very happy to marry Mr. Mark. Astrid's parents hand her a contract and a pen, asking her to sign it. Astrid, completely desperate, takes a pen and begins to sign it, starting to cry. Suddenly Jake enters the hall, saying that he heard that someone is buying the museum. Astrid doesn't understand why Jake is in the museum, and even in a security guard's costume. Mark yells at Jake again, telling him to get this idiot out of here and put him on the street. Jake approaches Mark and he tries to hit him, only to receive a strong blow to the face that sends him flying. Mark yells at Jake, threatening to drag him through the courts and send him to prison. Astrid is surprised to see Jake, asking him what he's doing here. Jake walks over to Astrid, wiping a tear from her face, causing her to blush in embarrassment. Astrid's parents ask her if she knows this man. Astrid tells them that this is her classmate, to which her father remarks that a guy at that age would be better off focusing on his studies rather than working as a security guard. Jake takes the contract to buy the museum and boldly tears it apart. Parents Astrid and Mark are upset about what happened, and the father grabs scraps from the floor, wondering what Jake did. Jake tells Astrid's father that he is offering him a billion dollars for this museum. Mark laughs at Jake, saying that if he actually buys this museum, he will eat a portion of crap to which Jake replies that he no longer believes in such a thing after the last person who bet him. While Jake and Mark are arguing, 
Astrid's parents ask her if her classmate is rich. Mark calls one of his friends, telling him that he needs to get rid of one person, asking him to bring several people here. Astrid's father tells Jake that he obviously came here for Astrid, so if he can guarantee a down payment of half of the amount, then both the museum and Astrid will belong to him. Astrid's father adds that if Jake can't find that much money, then the plan will remain the same and everything will belong to Mr. Mark. The secretary approaches Jake, handing him a new contract, telling him that its contents are identical to the previous one, except for the price and title. Jake reads the contract, realizing that all this legalese implies is an offer to buy Astrid, while Mark tells the main character that he can't just say he doesn't have the money and walk away. Jake thinks that this all looks terrible, because he will receive it as an item. Jake looks at the canvas, inspired by the poem written on it. He approaches him, saying that these artifacts have incredible power. Jake turns to the family, saying that he wants to change the terms of the contract. He adds that he wants to spend this billion only on the purchase of the museum, and artifacts will not be included in its price. From Jake's point of view, this painting and calligraphy is priceless and cannot be measured in money. Jake says that Astrid respects and sincerely loves these artifacts, so the right to use the museum and dispose of the artifacts passes to her. The main character turns to Astrid, telling her that if she needs money, she can call him. Jake takes out his card, successfully paying the full price of one billion dollars. Mark and Astrid's family don't believe Jake was able to pay the full price in one installment. Astrid approaches Jake and asks him why he is doing this. Jake turns to her and replies that he told her that he would buy back all the artifacts that belong to the people of China. Mark says that the entire collection of this museum is worth more than $500 million, and if Jake really wants to return all the world's artifacts, then he needs to attend an auction in Japan. According to Mark, this auction will include artifacts that are each worth more than a billion dollars. Jake confidently tells Mark that he will definitely attend this auction. Mark and his assistant run away realizing that they have nothing more to catch here. Mark leaves the museum, meeting the people he called for the massacre, telling them that everything is cancelled and they can get lost. Mark picks up the phone, receiving a call from his mysterious boss, saying that, unfortunately, the deal fell through due to the fault of some bastard from China. However, according to Mark, he managed to get his attention to the auction so he can personally apologize to his boss there. Mark's boss chuckles, saying that all the artifacts that belong to him will not be taken away by others. Mark calls his boss Mr. Flynn, and says that he will certainly be there to oversee this. Astrid's family warmly thanks Jake for saving him from such a situation, inviting him to have dinner with them. Jake, however, politely refuses, saying that he has a night shift today and is not hungry. Astrid's infatuation increases, and she smiles sweetly, looking after him. Astrid catches up with Jake asking him if he's really going to Japan next month. Having received an affirmative answer, she asks him to take her with him on this journey. The next morning, Jake leaves the room, remembering how he talked to Astrid half the night. He also remembers that after long conversations she accidentally fell asleep, but he had to be on duty until the morning and because of this he will have to sit sleepy today. Jake is found by Audrey and Unia, asking him how he is feeling and whether he slept last night. Audrey hugs Jake telling him that lack of sleep is not good and he can skip university to come and rest with her. Junia, meanwhile, says that classes are very important and she will sit next to him in the lecture. She adds that he can lie on her lap so he can listen and relax at the same time. Jake frowns, reminding Junia that he asked her to stop clinging to him. Junia, however, does not calm down and says that she cannot help herself, admitting that she is very much in love with him. She says she doesn't care if he's rich or not, and she just wants them to start over. Junior hands Jake a paper crane as a sign of recognition, saying that she will value his feelings and correct her past mistakes. The crowd shouts at Jake that such a straightforward confession is worth a lot, and he should forgive her. Jake sees that Junior's infatuation rate is at 86%, which indicates that she is not in love with him. Jake says to himself that he sees right through Junior, and she is not one of those people who can be touched by someone else's kindness towards them. Jake leaves Junia and Audrey, saying to himself that the only reason he likes Junia is because of her loneliness. Junia and Audrey glare at each other with hostility as the teacher enters the room, telling everyone to take their seats. After class, Audrey and Junia accompany Jake and Audrey invites him to come to her apartment and relax. Junia says that Jake is not Audrey's boyfriend, 
adding that it is not good to bring a guy into your apartment and have him sleep there. Audrey responds that Junaya doesn't understand anything about her relationship with Jake, explaining that he is single and doesn't have a girlfriend, and Junaya is just his ex. Junia and Audrey begin to actively argue with each other, throwing Chinese sayings at each other and making noise. Passersby begin to wonder what is happening between Audrey and Yunia. Jake asks the girls not to drag him into this quarrel, as he does not want to become famous throughout the university because of this. Suddenly, a Ferrari LF drives into the university courtyard, driven by Chai Chai. Driving past Audrey and Yunia, she picks up Jake and quickly leaves for home. Jake rests his head on Chai Chai's knee as you ask him if he got hurt. Jake is about to get up, but Chai Chai suggests that he not bother and lie down for a while. Jake thanks Chai Chai for her help, to which she replies that he can consider this as gratitude for all the donations and asks to leave another signature on her thigh. Yunia wonders who the girl was who took Jake away in front of everyone. Onlookers are surprised by what they see, saying that the car was driving so fast that they did not have time to see the girl behind the wheel. But note that the car definitely cost hundreds of millions of dollars. Junia flies into a rage, angry that as soon as Jake became rich, a bunch of rivals began to flock to him, trying to get money from him. Audrey notes that Janiya used to ignore Jake, but now she can't get him, adding that she has no chance. Junia tells Audrey not to be so self-confident, because the girl who took Jake is clearly richer than the two of them. Audrey replies that, unlike the other girls, she has made much more progress with Jake, so she has nothing to worry about. Yunia loses her temper, angrily asking Audrey what tricks she used, to which Audrey replies that she won't tell her. Audrey goes about her business, and Yunia says to herself that she doesn't believe her and thinks that Audrey is just bluffing. However, according to Yunia, Jake is so simple that he will not be able to hold out for long in such a siege. Yunia decides that she knows exactly what Jake likes, which means she will definitely win him back. A mysterious voice in his head tells Jake that Junia's passion level has increased by 4%, causing 10% of the amount spent on her to be credited to his account. Jake's stats increase again, and he chooses a new skill that allows him to master swimming. During the trip, someone is closely watching Jake through binoculars from afar. The observer turns out to be the student council president, who is preparing for a meeting. Audrey and Yunia's fight made the university news, once again exposing Jake's troubled relationship to the public eye. The student council president is angry that Jake and his antics again catch his eye. The president says that one student has just called the reputation of the university into question with his behavior. The president turns to the head of the literary department, asking which department these students are from, to which he replies that these are his students, calling them by name. The president tells the head of the literature department that he has high hopes for him, to which he replies that he will definitely punish Jake. The president responds that there is no need to do so if Jake admits and atones for his mistakes. The next day, Jake is sent to clean the pool, telling him that this punishment will last until the end of the semester. Jake, however, takes it in stride, saying that his girlfriend was indeed driving over the speed limit on campus. Jake also notes that he thinks this punishment is so bad because he got the opportunity to admire the girls in the pool. The girls in the pool compliment one of the athletes named Eva, saying that she has a great figure. Eva's friend tells her that her classmate named Tyler stares at her and follows her everywhere, to which she just brushes it off, saying that she is not interested in him. When asked what kind of guys she likes, Eva calmly replies that she will like the one who swims faster than her. Some girls notice Jake and start whispering about his recent popularity. Eva, however, is not interested in him, and she decides to take another swim. Suddenly Eva experiences a cramp in her foot and begins to drown. Eva tries to call for help by stretching her hand out of the water, but her friends do not understand what she wants to say. Unable to swim out on her own, Eva begins to think with horror that she is about to drown. Jake notices Eve, quickly realizing that she is in great danger. Without thinking twice, he runs up to the pool, making a quick and confident jump into the water. Using his acquired swimming skills, Jake quickly swims to help Eve. Having reached her, he helps her float up, holding her head above the water so that the girl does not choke. Eve begins to resist, screaming for Jake to let her go, to which Jake replies that she should calm down and just breathe. Jake swims to the side of the pool, holding Eve with one hand, asking her not to twitch and to trust him. Eve is amazed at how fast Jake swims even though he's holding her, 
noting that she's never been this close to a guy before. Jake pulls Eve out of the water, and she clears her throat thoroughly, slowly coming to her senses. Jake wrings out his t-shirt, telling Eve to be more careful next time. The friends surround Eva, asking about her condition and saying that she scared them very much. The students marvel at Jake's speed, saying he set a new record, while one of them filmed the whole thing and plans to post his feet online. Eve's friend tells her that Jake must be a pretty good person for saving her life. Suddenly, her friend notices that Eva is in the clouds, and a deep blush appears on her face. News that Jake proved himself to be a hero by driving the student council president crazy. Bearing a grudge against the main character, the president promises himself to destroy him. A few days later, the university is holding a student ball, and Junia and Audrey come to it. Audrey, with a smile on her face, tells Junia that she dressed up very nicely for tonight, but Jake still won't pay attention to her. Junia thanks Audrey for the snarky compliment, saying that after tonight, everything will change. Looking after her, Audrey suspects that Junia is up to something. Yunia says to herself that she sees right through Audrey and her cheap tricks, which make her seem like a smart and gentle girl. However, according to Yunia, men obey only their instincts. Yunia notices Eve and notes that she needs to clear one more obstacle first. Eve remembers the moments of her rescue, starting to blush again and taking a sip from her glass to calm down a little. Yunia approaches Eve, believing that she is another rival who wants to pester Jake and says hello darkly. Yunia introduces herself as Jake's girlfriend and asks Eve if she knows her. According to Yunia, Jake is very helpful and kind, and always helps people. Yunia continues to talk, saying that Jake chased her around for three years before they started dating and having a good time together. Junia adds that if Eva wants to thank Jake, she doesn't have to, because they have a date tonight. Eva, terribly frightened by Junia's assertive approach, runs away from the ball. Yunia rejoices at eliminating her potential rival declaring that no one stands a chance against her. Meanwhile, Jake sits quietly in his room while his friend urges him on, to which Jake complains that the group was forced into cleaning. Jake is told that most likely he somehow annoyed the student council president, which is why he gets into such troubles. According to Jake's friend, the president always used his official position to deal with people he disliked. Jake receives a message from the prefect saying that the student council president wants to personally present him with an award arousing Jake's suspicion. While Jake goes to the ball, he is guarded by Tyler, who is angry at him for stealing Eve from him. Angry, Tyler is tormented by thoughts of revenge and raises a brick over Jake's head. However, Jake, sensing his approach, turns and grabs Tyler. With a powerful movement, Jake throws Tyler to the ground, causing him to hit the asphalt with his cheek. Jake doesn't understand Tyler's actions, asking him why he attacked him. Tyler explains, calling Eve a bitch who doesn't even look at him, despite all his efforts, and regrets that he didn't take her by force at the time. Jake hits Tyler in the face with his boot, shutting him up. After dragging the unconscious Tyler to the trash heap, Jake decides to head to the ball. Finally arriving at the ball, Jake meets Audrey, who invites him to dance together. Jake agrees, scooping Audrey into his arms and beginning to dance with her. Audrey is pleasantly surprised at how smoothly and gracefully Jake moves. Jake and Audrey receive rave reviews from the crowd as they continue to dance gracefully. After the dance, other girls approach Jake, expressing a desire to dance, but Audrey tries to turn them away. However, the pressure of the girls does not stop and he is quickly surrounded by potential partners, causing Audrey's anger. The other guys get angry because they don't want to dance with them and start gossiping behind Jake's back that he doesn't deserve such treatment and awards from the student council president. 